Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Claudia Tobin. Welcome to the Royal Drawing School's lecture, summer lecture and conversation series. Uh, we're taking feminine power as our theme for discussion this evening, uh, inspired by um, the exhibition of this title, which is currently um, on at the British Museum. Feminine power, the divine to the demonic, is um, an immensely wide ranging and thought provoking exhibition, and it invokes goddesses, spirits, witches and saints across a huge uh, historical and cultural range to address some of the most pressing and enduring questions uh, about gender, spirituality and power. So um, I'm really delighted that to harness and to explore uh, the multifaceted uh, nature of feminine power from the ancient world to the modern. Uh, this evening we have the curator of the British, British Museum's exhibition, Belinda Creera, and um, the artist Sarah Pickstone. Um, welcome to you both. And I'd just like to introduce um, both Belinda and Sarah a little bit more. Uh, so Belinda is, um, as I mentioned, um, the lead curator of Feminine Power, the Divine to the Demonic. And she's a curator in the British Museum's International Engagement Department. And her work is focused on generating cross-collection uh, cross exhibitions using an interdisciplinary approach. She also manages the collection of Romano-British antiquities, as well as being a lead member of the major cross-collection research project, Empires of Faith. She has a particular interest in religious iconography and the art and archeology span of the Roman Empire after completing her doctorate on this subject at Cambridge University. Um, and so we're also joined by Sarah Pickstone, uh, who's a London-based painter. Uh, many of you listening will also know her as a tutor at the Royal Drawing School, Sarah's work has a broad interest in the idea of the feminine and how this manifests in contemporary art. And um, part of her kind of contribution to the conversation tonight is um, as a kind of foreign correspondent, I suppose, um, <laughs> after her recent uh, trip to the Venice Biennale. So she's gonna be thinking um, in particular about um, uh, this year's uh, Venice Biennale and the Milk of Dreams created by Celia Elamini. So, um, so to begin with, um, uh, well, Welcome to you both, warm welcome. Um, really great to have you both here um, to discuss uh, feminine power. And um, we've um, we decided to kind of begin with um, Belinda's exhibition. Um, and it's a real pri privilege that we've got Belinda with us this evening to take us through a kind of overview of the exhibition and to kind of draw us um, into, for some of us who, who, ha who, some people won't have seen the exhibition, some, some will be inspired to, to go on to see it after this um, conversation, I'm sure. Um, but to, to sort of take us through some of the conversations really that the exhibition um, uh, has stimulated between the historic and the contemporary um, and, and to sort of give us an insight into some of the um, works on display um, and then we'll go on to kind of have a, a discussion around some of some of the themes that it raises and and the ways it might connect to contemporary questions about art gender and power um, and just to you know remind and encourage everyone listening at home to you know, you're really welcome to, to post your questions and thoughts, comments um, in the chat box or the Q&A box. And I'll be um, keeping an eye on those and we'll, and we'll also return to um, your questions at the end. But do, do keep those um, flowing in if, if, you, if you'd like to. Um, so Belinda, over to you um, to begin with. Great, thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you so much for inviting me this evening. Um, shall I just bring up the slides? Yeah. Okay. Oh, geez. <laughs> there you go, got it now. <laughs> there we are, that looks wonderful. Right. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, as Claudia mentioned, um, I'm Belinda Creer. I'm the lead curator of the current British Museum exhibition, Feminine Power, the Divine to the Demonic. Um, and my role at the museum is um, to curate cross-cultural exhibitions, um, which are on display either in this case at the BM, but also tour internationally. Um, so this exhibition will be going on tour after it closes at the, in, in London in September. And it means that I work very closely with um, all of the specialist curators across the whole museum to research different parts of the collection, and draw together objects and stories from different cultures and different periods of history 
to create um, these thematic exhibitions which have a, a global and a contemporary significance. So this is the latest exhibition I've been working on. This um, has been in the pipeline really since about 2013 um, when the idea was conceived. And since then I've been doing a lot of research, uh, talking to a lot of people, um, but it's really been sort of intensively developed in the last two years um, over lockdown, which was challenging. And um, the exhibition starts, uh, will take to its starting point, different forces or spiritual beings um, from across world belief that are viewed, typically viewed as female, either represented in art in female form or described as such in texts um, or oral narratives, all have uh, a fluid gender identity. And through the objects, that were created to represent them um, or to honor them. We're looking at moments in the history in the belief of these figures, um, what they mean, how they influence people's lives. And crucially, we're asking visitors to consider why certain forces and powers have come to be viewed or represented in a female form or through female imagery in certain cultures. And what this says about perspectives on femininity, uh, on female authority, uh, and on gender more broadly. So the, the show is intended to raise questions in visitors' minds and to be a space for conversation. And to enhance this, we've been working with different faith communities on certain parts of uh, the show to inform the narrative and uh, explain or help explain what these um, beliefs and these spiritual beings mean today. And we've also been working with our five uh, guest speakers. So these are women from uh, different professional and personal backgrounds, different ages, who've been invited to come into the British Museum and talk to us and look through the objects and stories that we've chosen for each uh, section of the exhibition. And then they've shared with us their personal responses to these ideas um, based on their own lived experience. Um, and so you can see our five speakers here, uh, Bonnie Greer, playwright, author, the very classic is Mary Beard, uh, Elizabeth Day, author and um, podcaster, author of How to Fail, Rabia Sadiq, who's a um, human rights lawyer and former British Army major, and Deborah Francis White, the comedian and presenter of the Guilty Feminist. And their responses, these personal responses, have been recorded and they are um, uh, able to be downloaded in the gallery space. You can listen to them as a sort of alternative audio guide, I suppose, and it's there to provide a sort of alternative thread of commentary. Um, which is designed to raise questions and start a conversation. We're not expecting everyone to agree with what they've said, but that's the point, really. Um, and at the end of the exhibition, we've created an interactive space where visitors can share their own, their own thoughts and responses to some of the questions that the exhibition raises. So what I'm going to do briefly tonight is talk through um, some of the different sections of the exhibition and pick out a few of the objects and artworks um, that I think are particularly interesting or raise particularly interesting questions. So the exhibition is divided into five um, thematic sections and each of these sections looks at a topic of what we felt to be a sort of more or less universal um, aspect of human experience or belief. And each of these sections is bringing together um, objects representing beliefs and spiritual beings from different cultures and different periods of history to explore some of the commonalities and also the contrasts of ways in which these ideas have been framed in relation to um, female spiritual authority. So the first section of the exhibition is looking at ideas surrounding nature, the power of nature, and creation, creation of life, uh, creation of the earth, and how this is often framed in female terms. Um, and there's enormous variety in beliefs about how the cosmos and the earth and life came into being, some revolving around a single creator deity, perceived as either female or male, or uh, very often bi-gendered, um, or multiple beings, or often create a couple. 
And these stories very often revolve around ideas of um, birth and sex as a sort of positive creative acts. So uh, here we have in the exhibition this print, which was made by uh, Judy Chicago in the 1980s as part of a wider project um, called Birth Project. And this print is called The Creation. And it's Chicago's um, reimagining of the biblical creation story from Genesis, viewed from a very consciously feminist perspective. And she said in yeah, interviews about this project, she was inspired by reading about different creation stories from other worlds, um, and also to challenge the, in her words, the fake news of a male god creating the first man, as famously shown on the uh, ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Michael Lynch's creation of Adam. So as a response to that, she's created this very visceral image of childbirth, which positions a female deity uh, filling the scene whose body is literally erupting with life. One of her breasts is a volcano, she's grasping the sun and she's lying in the birthing position as primordial life is flowing out of her vulva and evolving to the right of the scene. And I feel like this is deliberately a very provocative image where Chicago is challenging that common visualization that, that has evolved in Western traditions depicting God uh, as male, but also confronting those taboos, uh, which she saw surrounding uh, depictions of childbirth as a creative and life-giving act, um, and indeed depictions of female genitalia in Western art. This other print, which appears uh, nearby, was made around 1850 by the Japanese printmaker um, Hiroshige. And this depicts um, the Shinto creation story, um, where we can see the created couple, Izanami and Izanami, who means uh, she who beckons and he who beckons. And they are standing on the floating bridge of heaven. And they've just stirred the primordial oceans and the islands of Japan are emerging around them as you can see these rocky outcrops. And um, you might be able to see I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, here, this is a wagtail bird on the rocks in front of them. And they're looking at each other in such a slightly quizzical way. And according to the story, which is written out above the print, and this is the moment where they discover the sex and watching the bobbing tail of the wagtail bird. And this allows the couple to unite um, and give birth to many other Shinto spirits. So here we have an example of a creation story where female and male agency are uh, both essential to the creation of the earth and in this case the spirit world. And this is something that we also see in uh, Hindu belief that the image on the right is a 16th century gilt bronze figurine from Nepal which shows the uh, god Vishnu and the goddess Lakshmi uh, combined into a single, single bigendered being. So as you're looking at it, Vishnu's half is the left half, Lakshmi is the right half, and they're distinguished by um, a single breast and different um, male and female ear ornaments and clothing. And Lakshmi is a goddess who, um, whose ancient origins were connected to the fertilization and enrichment of the earth. Um, and today that belief has evolved very much to connect it with success and wealth and a business, but it's sort of the same idea, this idea of fertilization bringing prosperity. Um, and Vishnu, her partner, on this case, um, the, the other side of her, is the sustainer of the cosmos. So this figure is expressing that intrinsic unity between the uh, masculine and the feminine in Hindu belief, um, and in this case, that, that prosperity which accompanies cosmic balance. So from here, um, the exhibition moves on to explore spiritual ideas surrounding sex and passion and desire um, in regard to female influence. Sometimes seen as a divine force, sometimes as a demonic force, uh, or sometimes somewhere in between. So we have these two sculptures placed uh, next to each other in the show. 
Uh, on the right is a Roman marble sculpture of the goddess Venus made in the second century AD, um, but it was inspired by uh, an older Greek cult statue of the goddess Aphrodite, um, Aphrodite the Greek name for Venus, uh, which has now been lost, but was created in the fourth century BC by the Athenian sculptor Praxiteles. And it was often said, or is often said to have been the first uh, large scale depiction of female nudity in Western art. On the left, we have a contemporary artwork by the American artist Peggy Smith, showing her vision of the Jewish demon Lilith, which she made in 1994. So Venus or Aphrodite is sometimes called goddess of love. I think this does her a bit of a disservice. I think she should be thought of more as a goddess of passion. Um, because she is the sort of divine embodiment of both the chaotic and the harmonizing potential of passion in all its forms, from love uh, and desire through to rage and violence. Um, so she is this very much the sort of ambivalent power of conflict uh, and of resolution, who was important not only in terms of personal relationships and marriage and desire and sex but also uh, for civic power as the bringer of peace uh, or war and success and failure. Um, and we have in the exhibition some coins which were dedicated to Venus by generals, Roman generals and statesmen, and honoring her as their patron deity, which, uh, in which they're thanking her for granting their military victories, which really expresses how important she was to uh, statecraft as well as um, marital relations. So Lilith, uh, by contrast, is uh, a demon uh, in Jewish mysticism. Uh, she's said to be the lover of Satan, a child killer uh, who steals men's sperm in their sleep to give birth to demon babies. Um, she's also said to be the first woman of creation made at the same time and from the same earth as Adam. And according to mystical texts, um, in Eden, Adam demanded that Lilith would recognize his dominance over her as her husband, and she refused, saying that since they were created at the same time, from the same earth, they were equal. Um, and rather than submit to him, she chose to flee Eden and aligned herself with Satan. Um, so we put these artworks together in the same space, very different figures from different beliefs. Um, to look particularly at the different expressions of power that they convey, in particular through the use of nudity. Um, the image of Venus, I feel like this is, this is an image that we often don't give enough attention to because it has become so familiar. But back in its day, when female nudity, particularly female nudity on this scale, was not this common. We know from accounts of the, the statue that this was based on, that this was shocking, really shocking, not a gentle image of a, of a woman stepping out of her bath, um, but a real expression of erotic power um, that was suitable for a goddess of desire. And it's a portrayal of the goddess that really focuses on her beauty and eroticism and seductive power and it's been it's inspired a lot of debate amongst classicists about how do we read this image um, is she trying to cover herself with her hands and hide her body or is she in fact drawing attention to her body with where she's positioning her hands is she turning her head and uh, averting her gaze to be coy or coquettish or is she being sort of haughtily refusing to, to meet her gaze um, it's been seen as a very voyeuristic image, and indeed it is sort of intended to be voyeuristic. Um, the, the original Praxitelian sculpture was set in the middle of a circular temple and designed to be seen from all angles. Um, but does that mean that she's a sort of powerless figure? We have to remember that we're looking at an image of a goddess, not a, of a woman, and the, um, the original Greek statue was said to have an arrogant smile, which I think sort of changes that dynamic of here. So we're not looking at a woman who is um, uncomfortable with being looked at, we're looking at a goddess who is, uh, you know, knows she's being looked at and 
and knows the effect that she's having on her audience. And there are all sorts of accounts of men being so overwhelmed with desire at seeing the statue that they try to have sex with it and then pull themselves off cliffs. This was a very shocking image um, in the ancient world. And indeed, the, the fact that we have this Roman copy of it, there are a lot of copies of the statue because it was so famous. And then we have Lilith, um, a contemporary sculpture made by a female artist who she is crouching on the wall. You don't really get a good impression of it uh, from this image, but she's positioned quite high up on the wall. She's crouching above us and looking down at us. And um, Smith's sculpture is cast in the body of a real woman. So this is an actual female body, not a uh, idealized depiction by a, a classical male artist. But she's positioned in such a way that it, she's, her body is almost entirely obscured. You can't look at Lilith in the same way that you can look at Venus. And this is perhaps um, an element of that sort of defiance, defiance of the male gaze projected through a spiritual figure known for her defiance um, and her rebellion against patriarchal values, who has over time been demonized for this. Um, and certainly since the mid 20th century, embraced for it as an icon of uh, feminism and gender equality. So these are just the sorts of questions that by positioning the objects in this way, we're trying to prompt in people's minds to when they look at these images. And there's no right or wrong way to respond to them, but, but through bringing them together, we can more easily interrogate uh, the different ways that these objects express their power through nudity and invite this sort of conversation and reflection. So the next section is moving on to look at some ideas um, from different faiths or mythologies or folklores around the world that have connected female authority to uh, danger and evil intent, looking at or asking why female authority has been at times viewed as something threatening or destabilizing for individuals um, or society, a wider society, through stories about monsters and demons and uh, different changing perspectives on witches and witchcraft. So we have um, some representations in this section uh, from different periods of history for different artists of witches, such as the one on the left here, which is uh, known as the Witch's Sabbath by Hans Holden Green, made about 1510. And this is an image which I feel has come to sort of exemplify um, that the idea of uh, the sort of satanic, lustful, hag like witch of the early modern period. And you often find this image um, on the front cover of books about witch trials and, and so on. Um, but what's what I find interesting about this is it's actually more than likely to be a satirical work that's actually poking fun um, at some of the accusations that were leveled against women accused of witches um, in the sort of 16th century and later, like the idea that they rode backwards um, through the sky on goats, and uh, particularly that they literally emasculated men by stealing their penises, which I think Balgon Green seems to be referencing here where he's placed a lot of plastic sausages hanging over this branch. Um, and he was a, a humanist artist, so um, it seems unlikely that this was meant to be a sort of frightening image, more sort of comedic image. But nonetheless, these prints circulated very widely and, um, and may have compounded that sort of popular association that was growing at this time of magic and witchcraft and women in particular. And then contrasting this, we have this work from the 1940s um, from the series called The Dance of the Nine Maidens by Arthur Cahoon, um, which is on loan from Tate. And Cahoon, when she was making this series, were, was inspired, inspired by uh, witches' dances and traditional belief in Britain that ancient stone circles were women who were turned to stone for dancing on Sabbath. And it's an image that conveys Cahoon's own magical beliefs. She, she was a magical artist and she incorporated um, this into her artistic techniques. And it's expressing her much more positive ideas about magic and uh, divine feminine power, which she believed infused the natural world 
um, was particularly concentrated at the sites of ancient stone henges. However, the subject matter is still drawing on this traditional folklore that uh, women who transgressed prescribed ideas on female behavior or decorum uh, were punished for it through transformation. And this is an idea that we also see reflected in the Hanya mask using used in Japanese no theater to portray a Kijo demon, which is a woman who has or is transformed into a demon through the strength of her own emotion and anger, which is usually bound up with jealousy. So, excuse me. <laughs> so in performances, uh, the actor will be wearing um, a mask of a mortal woman, which will normally have a porcelain white skin, and then they would switch it on stage through sort of sleight of hand or the hand mask to convey the moment of transformation when the woman becomes demonic. But what I really love about these masks is the way that they are created, the way that they are designed is not only to express that physical transformation, but also the accompanying emotional turmoil. So you can see that she has these very high eyebrows, which are a sign of aristocratic beauty. So that's her sort of former identity um, being, being retained in some part. But obviously she has these horns sprouting out of her, her temples, her mouth is contorted, uh, she's got these fangs. Um, but she's also got these very deeply furrowed brows, which as the actor tilts their head, can be used to express that despair and suffering. So for me, these works are all asking questions surrounding this perception of women as uncontrolled or uncontrollable and therefore dangerous, um, which leads these figures to be seen as less than human or perhaps more than human um, in different mythologies around the world. Belinda, can I just um, come in there? Because you're you're really bringing out the uh, the kind of sacred power, the magical power of, of um, believed to be inherent in many of, of the objects and works um, in the exhibition. Um, you know, I'm thinking of, of Lilith and, and the Buddhist photo sculptures. Um, I think you'll come on to look at the, the Russian Orthodox icon. Um, but I just wondered if you might say something about how this might involve a particular kind of um, approach or sensitivity in the actual curation of the show. Um, you know, I think you mentioned one particular occasion where a, a, a specific ritual was performed when that representation entered into the museum. And that just, it seemed to me something interesting just to touch on there, if you might. Yeah, absolutely. So the exhibition has a, a really broad range of different sorts of objects yeah. um, in the show. Some are sacred images. Um, like this one actually that you can see on the screen um, of Kali. Um, some are uh, sacred images from past cultures, um, like the Statue of Sekhmet that you can see, um, which sort of adds additional complications. Do we treat them as sacred images? Because they are still sacred to some people. And we've been working with, uh, well, for that section that I just mentioned on witchcraft, we were working with a group called the Children of Artemis, who are a, a group of Wiccans and modern pagans. Um, so when you look at, say, for example, the statue of Sekhmet that was made um, about 1350 BC, it's still a sacred object for some people today who identify as modern pagans and to sort of revitalize the worship of these goddesses. So you can't predict how visitors to the exhibition are going to encounter these works either as artworks or secular um, pieces um, or sacred pieces from the past or sacred pieces to them today. So I think you have to just be a bit alive to that um, and sort of treat them all in the most respectful way that you can, um, because it is, a, it is an exhibition which is talking about faith and belief, and that's often very personal. So um, we didn't want to, it was very important to me when we were putting the show together that we didn't treat any of the objects um, as if they were just purely cultural objects, because they all have, as spiritual significance in some 
way. Um, at the very least, they're all depicting spiritual beings, which people respond to in different ways, even the contemporary artworks like, like Henry Smith's Lilith, um, which I don't think she intended to be an object to be venerated. But um, she uh, she told us this really interesting story, actually, when that, that, that um, Lilith is on loan from the Met in New York, and she said when the Met acquired it, um, there was a young curator's assistant who was Jewish and pregnant at the time, and she refused to go into the same room as the statue because of Lilith's reputation as um, harming for harming children. So these these objects, they, they still have power for for different people. Um, but yes, this one that you mentioned, this statue of Carly. Um, is a new commission for the British Museum that we um, acquired specially for this exhibition. Um, so Kali is one of the most important deities in Hinduism today, and we wanted to express this, um, her sort of contemporary importance, by showing um, a modern icon of her. So this was created by an artist based in Calcutta called Kashyap Ghosh, who comes from a long lineage of artisans who make um, icons of Hindu deities either for puja festivals or for temples around the world. And um, it was made in accordance with those sort of canons and strictures that surround the creation of Hindu sacred art. So it incorporates play from the Ganges, um, he began work on it at, uh, on a particularly auspicious day. And we were also working with this group called the London Staff Committee or a Bengali um, temple in Camden, London. And they were helping us acquire the statue. And when it arrived in London from Calcutta, they performed uh, a blessing ceremony which was intended to infuse the icon with the spirit of Kali. And Kali is a very uh, terrifying goddess. She's a goddess that encompasses in um, destruction and time and uh, fearlessness. And she's a, a very bloodthirsty warrior. Um, and so the ceremony was also to appease the goddess's wrath that having just been created up and shipped over from India for several days and to ask her permission to be shown in the BM and in the exhibition. And so this, this preparatory ceremony was necessary just to include this work in the show. And there's a video of that. If anyone goes to the exhibition and wants to see the ceremony, you can download a video of it, um, which they allowed us to share to see what goes into it, like why why these objects are important, that they're more than just sort of museum pieces or gallery pieces. Um, so I'll just say something about another thing about Carly, uh, which was fascinating for me to learn about was um, her iconography, because at first sight, as a non-Hindu myself, it looks rather gruesome. But um, the Kali is, um, well, she's a, she's a warrior goddess. She's sort of viewed as a, a very terrifying, also quite dangerous and unstable presence. Um, and she's an embodiment of Shakti, which means power. And Shakti is specifically a feminine divine energy in Hindu cosmology that radiates through the cosmos and animates all things. So Kali is a manifestation of this power uh, as are all Hindu goddesses, both from sort of gentle goddesses like Lakshmi, who we met earlier, um, through to Kali. And um, like I said, she's, she's quite a sort of unstable, dangerous force, which is expressed here by her dancing wildly on the body of her husband, the god Shiva. And she's got her hair unbound and she's got her tongue sticking out. And she's brandishing this um, sacrificial sword, which is dripping with blood. Um, but it's also an image of her liberating power. She's often dressed as Ma Kali or Mother Kali. Um, and she uses this sword to uh, sever her followers from their ego, which is represented by the severed garland of heads that she's wearing, and also from the karma and their attachment to worldly concerns, which is represented by her skirt of bloodied arms. So what first appears 
quite gruesome, it's actually expressing this sort of ferocious compassion um, that she has, and it's sort of emblematic of this more salvific power. Um, and her aggression is always directed towards defeating chaos, demonic forces, um, on those sort of impediments to spiritual growth, like greed and envy and pride and sense of self. Um, so it's a very different way of conceiving of a compassionate deity, I suppose. <laughs> Um, and now I'll just say a little bit about uh, Sekhmet as well. So Sekhmet is the uh, Egyptian goddess of war and annihilation and disease. And she's presenting art with a head of a lioness, uh, which makes a lot of sense because the lioness was the most ferocious hunter in the uh, North African landscape. So very much reflecting the natural world of her. But she was also connected with protection. Um, and divine justice, and you can't really see it in this image, unfortunately, but in her right hand, she's holding the Ankh, the hieroglyph for life, and she was addressed as both the lady of slaughter and also the mistress of life. Um, and this statue of Sekhmet is one of hundreds and hundreds, which were made all in this black stone by Pharaoh Amenhotep III, um, who, like I mentioned, is ruled Egypt from about 1390 to 1350 BC. And I think the like, colossal volume of these statues, and if you go to um, the Temple of Karnak in modern Luxor in Egypt, you can see them all still in, set, in situ. Um, I think that sort of expresses the importance that he felt of honouring this somewhat terrifying and disruptive goddess, possibly as a way of appeasing her wrath, maybe much like the blessing ceremony um, that we held in the BM for Kali. Um, so that she would not destroy him and ensure a long life and, uh, and prosperity for his reign. Um, and indeed, he did have a very long and prosperous reign, so maybe it worked. <laughs> Sorry, Chloe? No, I was just going to, I mean, it's something that we can come back to, but just so many of these, um, of the representations share this, this quality of of um, hybridity, don't they? The, just thinking of the Egyptian sculpture, but many of the, the works that you, you've spoke to, spoken about and that feature in the exhibition sort of incorporate um, different genders or elements of, or elemental um, uh, beings or uh, plants, animals, as this sort of um, feature of shape-shifting. And that, it, it seems a, a sort of near universal element or aspect of representing the feminine, which just is really striking. I think that really emerges from your exhibition. Um, yeah, it really does. And actually, I'll just go back a slide um, because one of the one of the sort of hurdles that we had when we were putting the exhibition together is that we have sort of categorized these um, spiritual beings who are by nature very complex and multifaceted. So within each of the sections, we, we're just sort of looking at, um, in some cases, just a sort of singular aspect of that spiritual being. And I think these two objects are a really good example of that, because like I mentioned, Kali is a manifestation of Shakti, but Shakti can manifest in many different ways, um, and through many different goddesses who are associated with different sort of qualities. Um, they're all actually intrinsically the same power. Yeah. Um, and that's actually a similar case for Sekhmet as well. And there's a, um, a myth, an Egyptian myth, which talks about Sekhmet called um, the destruction of mankind, um, which is also known as the myth of the heavenly cow, because uh, in the story, the, the sun god Ra wants to destroy humankind because he's been, become displeased with the lack of worship. And so he calls on his daughter, the goddess Hathor, who is the uh, cow-headed goddess of pleasure and abundance and the Nile floods and beauty, a very sort of gentle um, goddess. And Hathor then transforms into the lioness Sekhmet to go and destroy the human race. And she starts rampaging across the battlefields and destroying everyone. And she becomes so uncontrollable um, that Ra can't stop her and has to give her a lot of beer to sort of calm her down. Eventually she calms down, she gets so drunk that she calms down and she turns back into Hathor. So these two deities, the Hathor and Sekhmet, the sort of gentle, benevolent goddess of prosperity and the um, lioness, goddess of annihilation, are intrinsically the same being as well. It's different manifestations of the same uh, 
feminine power. And we see that throughout the show in that there, there are there are figures that would be equally at home in many of the different sections. Venus has martial aspects to how she would approach. She could be in this section as well. So we're hoping that that comes across in the exhibition that people will make these connections between the sections as well as between the objects within each of the sections. Um, it certainly does. <laughs> it certainly is effective. <laughs> Uh, so the final section is uh, we're looking at concepts of compassion and uh, salvation, um, which is often envisaged in parental or often specifically maternal terms. So here we're looking at some of the many ways that Mary has been honoured and represented in different Abrahamic traditions. Um, so here we have a 16th century Eastern Orthodox icon. Um, called the Virgin Hodigetria, which means she who shows the way. And as you can see, Mary is holding her son Jesus, who is the savior in Christian belief, and she is pointing towards him. And this is positioning Mary as the guide, the one who guides the faithful to salvation. Um, and it's got this beautiful gilt silver um, revetment around it, which is there to not only sort of enhance the beauty and the majesty of the icon, but it's also a, a sort of practical way of protecting the painting underneath, which is the very sacred element of the work from incense smoke and candle smoke during worship. And then we're also looking at the importance of Mary in Islam um, and how prominent she is in the Quran, which is mentioned more times in the Quran than she is in the Bible. Um, not as a divine figure, of course, but nonetheless as a role model of fortitude and strength and uh, particularly faith through suffering. Um, and here we've been working with a group of Muslim women who have been sharing moments in their lives when they uh, were brought on Mary to help them get through these particularly difficult situations, um, not least childbirth. And this is a calligraphic artwork by the Sudanese artist Osman Rakiala. Uh, made in the 1980s, in which he has recreated the whole of the Marian Sutra, the, the whole chapter of the Quran, which is named after Marian, uh, which describes her suffering in childbirth, and in, which is described in very visceral terms. It's, uh, she's said to sort of scream out as if she's dying and she's completely alone and she's going through this. It's a very sort of real depiction of childbirth and the pain and the suffering. Um, and then the comfort which is sent to her by God. And this is a chapter of the Quran that women in particular are encouraged to recite um, around childbirth. So Mary is probably one of the more familiar figures in the exhibition to many visitors. And um, we're looking at the, the importance of Mary across different Abrahamic traditions alongside concepts of compassion from different schools of Buddhism. Both of these figurines were made um, around the 18th century, and they both show the Buddhist Bodhisattva of compassion. Um, the one on the left uh, is a gilt wooden figure from Tibet and shows a Bodhisattva in male form. And the one on the right um, uh, depicts them in female form and uh, is made of multi porcelain from China. And so the Bodhisattvas are enlightened beings um, who have achieved spiritual awakening, but rather than leave the uh, world of suffering and rebirth known as samsara, have chosen to remain close to mortals in order to guide others towards nirvana. Um, both of the names given here, Avalokiteshvara for the Tibetan one, Guanyin for the um, Chinese one, they both mean the same thing, they both mean perceiver of sounds because the Bodhisattva of Compassion is believed to be able to hear all the cries of the suffering. And you can see on both images, they're showing with many arms, which um, indicates their ability to reach everyone in need. And the historical reasons why imagery of the Bodhisattva of Compassion changed from male um, in Tibet and North India to female as Buddhism spread eastward is not very well understood, but it most likely has something to do with the way compassion is perceived in different cultures. 
um, as a masculine quality in Tibet um, and as a feminine quality in China and indeed other East Asian countries, Japan, Korea will also represent the receptive compassion in the female form traditionally in art. Um, but there's also an intrinsic gender fluidity to how the Bodhisattva of compassion is perceived as an enlightened being, all enlightened beings in Buddhist thought, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are um, viewed as um, genderless in their most perfect form because they are, have transcended all limitations and all binaries, but they appear in human form um, so that they can be uh, comprehensible to mortals, I suppose. But in regard to the Bodhisattva of compassion and perceiving of sounds, they are explicitly said to be able to appear in whatever form they choose, whether that is female or male or human or animal or dragon or any form, whatever is necessary for the personal salvation of each individual. So this fluidity of gender is very central to the salvific powers of the Bodhisattva of compassion. Linda, I wonder if I might just um, just come in there because um, yes. I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm, I, 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 I am aware that, that time's slipping away and I do, uh, I do want to bring Sarah in too. And I yes. wonder if that's a good moment to do so. Um, just because, partly because the, the exhibition is so brilliant at, at sort of initiating these conversations between the historic and contemporary representations. And I know that's not something that Sarah has been thinking about um, uh, on her trip to, to, to the Biennale. Um, so Sarah, I don't know if this is a good I love the idea of being a, a foreign I'm so foreign sorry, I don't <laughs> No, 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 it's fantastic. No, I, unfortunately, all my questions were, were the same as Claudia's, so uh, Claudia has asked the questions I wanted to ask of you. Um, it's so, so interesting and the show is fantastic and we're just so lucky to have it, I think. I would have loved to have seen it as a younger artist. Um, it's so scholarly and yet so accessible and so broad and you've thought of everything. It's very contemporary. In fact, before I saw the exhibition, um, um, Claudia, um, you know, invited me to do this, to, to talk with you. I was thinking of asking you questions around you know, political identity, why have you chosen the word power with feminine? And I was coming at from a very external point of view. And then when I went to see the show, I became very involved with all the objects, the differences between the objects, because that is what struck me, is just that the complexities of the differences of the different types of forms of uh, female authority, the different figuring around that, um, all the cultural issues, the, the spiritual ideas. And in fact, I became really fascinated about this, the, the, the notions of why spiritual ideas are so difficult to talk about in the contemporary art world, because they are really, because contemporary art is supposed to be more rational and um, to have um, maybe more emphasis on, on the political, which of course your show does as well. But having been to the uh, Venice Biennale, and it's great to finish on this last slide of yours here, uh, because this is a contemporary artist, isn't it, who made this work for you. Um, and it, it moves very nicely into um, the Biennale show, which, um, as Claudia mentioned, was curated by Cecilia Nemani, who's an Italian curator. Um, and Really, there's so much work there. The Milk of Dreams is basically an exhibition that foregrounds the, the, the idea of the human experience. Um, for those of you that don't know about the Venice Biennale, it's a very, very old show bringing together lots and lots of contemporary artists. There are, um, there are over 200 artists in the show. There are over 50 countries represented. It's not at all like an art fair. Couldn't be more different. It's a really carefully curated show. A lot of young artists too, a lot of artists from all over the world who aren't necessarily very kind of clubbable commercial artists. They're, you know, I think Cecilia Alemani went to great lengths to find people and um, show, showcase their work at, in Venice. Shall we go to that first slide then? Yes. Yeah. So I will just, Really quickly nip through my my pictures. Taken I'm so sorry, Sarah. 
<laughs> no, no, I was going to do it quickly anyway, because really the point is, is that the point of me talking about Venice is to, to show you also and us all what the rest of the world are making and, um, and how they're responding and how your exhibition is so important to see at this time. I know you've been conceiving it since 2013, but um, it seems very timely to me. Um, so here we have a work by Mrinalini Mukherjee, um, who was born in Bombay and had four decades of working in India. She's no longer alive. Um, but what I liked about this work, and I thought that it's had so many similarities, especially um, with some of the larger monumental pieces in your show, Belinda. I love the idea of this kind of domestic knotting um, of material uh, being used to create something very monumental. Um, and the next slide, we'll, we'll nip through these, I think. So this is an artist called Candice Lynn, who is, uh, lives in LA. Um, I think, I thought Colhoun would really appreciate her. Mm -hmm. Belinda, I think she's known for her use of very inventive materials, um, mushrooms, dead, dead bats, you know, the usual stuff. She mixes anthropology with natural history. Um, and I think obviously the work here is talking about the human and its connection to the environment. And the next slide. Here we have Louise Bonnet, who's a Swiss artist. Now, I think this really relates to the Judy Chicago print at the beginning of your show, which is just such a wonderful image of the female creativity. Um, and here, um, you know, the, the Bonnet is showing uh, showing uh, enormous female figures um it's beautifully painted beautifully constructed painting um dealing with their bodily fluids here maybe not creating in quite the same way but it certainly had a monumental um mon monumental goddess sort of feel it and that same exclusive quality to it as the judy chicago um, yes as well just yeah Exactly, exactly. I, mean, I think she's probably looked at a lot of Judy Chicago's work. So next slide. Ah, oh, so here today, I think we should dedicate this talk to Paula Rago, um, who has sadly died today. The show at the, at the, in the Venice Biennale, the shows are divided into two sites. There's the Giardini, where there are representatives representatives of maybe 30 countries and 30 different small architecturally built pavilions, which, you know, I think the British pavilion was, was built in 1909 and the, the South Korean one in the 2000s. Um, and then there were curated shows within that. Uh, Alemani has curated also historical shows within Milk of Dreams, and it centers on the experience of surrealist artists um, Eileen Agar, um, Leonor Feeney, um, Leonora Carrington herself, and it gives some context to the notion of expressing what it is to be a human being through the imagination as well, through, and this whole thing that you're, we're discussing, the idea of multiplicity, the possibility of transformation, um, the possibilities for a younger generation to become who they want to be, and for us to become better human beings, I think. Um, Paula Rago has an enormous section in the Venice Biennale, the curated section, and it's obviously so timely. This piece um, struck me because it, it sort of seems to resemble an altarpiece. Um, and she shows the puppets that she works from in the studio. Um, she works mainly from the model in the studio, um, but I thought it had a, a great kind of altarpiece feel. Yeah, um, it feels very like the sort of private, devotional, small scale kind of domestic. Yeah. Like almost like kids playing with a wardrobe and then. Wardrobe, wardrobe. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So their parents don't see that they've painted on the inside of it. Um, and the next slide. So on the left here, Simone Lee, who represented the United States in the Biennale and um, makes these again, wonderful, monumental, contemporary um, sculptures. Um, so 
experience in America. And it just creates these wonderful figures, gives such dignity to their kind of, and she has such an amazing material skill as well. They're beautifully formed, often in bronze, or I um, can't actually remember what this one is called. Uh, what this one's made of, but this one was inside the pavilion. And on the right here, something by by way of contrast, maybe um, the, a Danish artist called Uffe Isolotten um, from the Danish pavilion, and his sort of expression of actually of ultimate distress. Actually, it, it was quite a distressing display. This is the least distressing of the images. But I quite like the idea of the centaur. I think it spoke also to classical mythology that we're used to seeing with animals becoming half the, half the figure. Um, I thought that was really interesting. And again, if you move on, I, here we have Cecilia Vicuña, um, who is um, a Chilean artist. Both these artists are Chilean, actually. Cecilia Vicuña has um, a multimedia practice. And in this case, this painting and takes inspiration from 19th century Incan artists in Cusco in Peru. Uh, they were forced to convert to Catholicism. So she's kind of, she's kind of, um, kind of weaponizing painting in that sense and um, renders this painting beautifully of this leopard with eyes all over it and um, his genitalia on full show. Certainly an image of feminine power to me. Um, on the right here, Sandra Vasquez de la Jorra. Um, like Vicuña, she was exiled from Chile because of Pino Pinochet. But the thing that this artist I read is that she seals her drawings in beeswax, which kind of creates this, evokes a religious connotation and adds a layer of vulnerability to the materiality that she's working with. And I just thought some of the drawing year would be quite interested in these images. And I, they sort of seem very familiar to me when I go around the studios, you know, um, especially this one on the right, I think, seems to have a universal presence and quality about it. And the next slide. Here we have Emma Talbot, who may be very familiar. She's a UK um, artist, painter. These are beautiful paintings and drawings on silk. And here um, Emma Talbot has incorporated the figures into the landscape. She's kind of assumed the figures. The figures have no features. They are part of the environment, confused and wondering what it's all about. Um, and obviously Emma Talbot referencing the Gauguin painting here, but kind of representing it as a feminist piece here. Um, where am I to? Next slide then. Yeah, these two are lovely paintings. So here on the left is Portia Zvavahira, um, a young artist from Zimbabwe making huge paintings. She works with dreamscape and there's an emotional intensity to the life of her figures. She talks very clearly about spiritualism, about the Zimbabwean faith that she um, respects and also her apostolic Pentecostal beliefs. And I think there's just, again, a lot of shapes are shifting, which is Claudia's brilliant word, um, shape shifting um, in the imagery. And there's also a lot of ritual in the work. Uh, there's, um, and she talks about painting as spiritual catharsis. Uh, and here on the right, Christina Quales, which will be familiar to many um, students, I think, um, a fantastic queer American artist who, uses gesture as figure, um, who, you know, can't, doesn't want to settle on one definition of the figure, so um, makes it multiplicitous, they're merging and they're undefined, they're transformed. And again, this theme of fluidity. Um, and then finally, I think the last slide there, Okay, so this is Sonia Boyce who, hooray, won the Golden Lion Award for the British Pavilion for her work there. And it's a fantastic piece visually, also hourly, because it's a sound recording of her in a studio in London, 
um, singing, improvising with other black female British artists. And I thought your exhibition, I know begins, um, Belinda, with the voices of the, your, your advisors, Mary Beard, etc. And I, so I thought it was fitting to end with um, the soundtrack of um, Sonia Boyce here. And you can just play a little bit, actually, if you put your purse on the image on the left at the bottom, you can just hear that. Brilliant, Sarah, thank you so much. So many resonances with, with Belinda's exhibition. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, really fantastic. Um, I just wondered if we could, if I could ask you though um, about sort of channeling feminine power unconsciously or consciously in your own, in your own work. Cause uh, you know, I was just thinking about, often thinking about Virginia Woolf and just thinking about that notion of that we think back through our mothers um, and she think, she's thinking of mothers as biological mothers, but also kind of creative mothers. And I was just thinking of your, your, your project um, at the RA, um, your, your homage um, to um, the work of Angelica Kaufman, um, one of, I think only two women among the, the, the Royal Academy's founding members. Um, and I just, yeah, I wondered, you know, what's your sense of um, that act of homage or that act of channeling feminine power, whether it's historical or contemporary figures? Well, it's true. I mean, one of the, one of the questions I was going to ask Belinda was really about the difference between making an aesthetic piece of work that's aesthetically pleasing and that has artistic merit, which all of the pieces do, and, and the point of its own spiritual power. So um, while I couldn't say that in any way there's a spiritual connection to Angelica Kaufman or I was in any way trying to invoke her, well, actually, I was trying to evoke her because I really needed her help on such a big painting. But, um, and she did become a kind of, she did become an important feminine voice, a voice of authority. Another word of Belinda's that I really like is feminine authority. And she, yeah, she became that to me whilst I was making the work. And since the work of mine in the park that you mentioned, Virginia Woolf, I do use, I do use, um, female figures from history and literature to sort of summon, summon courage in, on difficult things in the studio. <laughs> but I can't, I feel a bit uncomfortable about putting them on the same, you know, the same basis to, as, um, as Sekhmet or, you know, uh, Ibaka, obviously. It's a, it's a different thing, but it, I think it's really interesting. And I do think there's a big question to be had about the inner interiority, the spiritual world of the female artists, especially mm. in and, and the male artists, in, in all artists, I should say, um, in the contemporary art world. Mm. Yeah, and I, I wanted, you know, thinking about, you know, everyone listening on uh, on the drawing year and 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 further afield, and and perhaps, you know, people might like to, to comment on this, but you know, when, when Belinda was talking about the sort of animate or the magical quality in her and in many of the, the works um, and objects um, in, in the exhibition, I was just thinking about what, what does an artist do, you know, in, in response to these works, you know, is drawing, because many of the students at the drawing school um, take courses that are, that, that engage with the objects at the British Museum, don't they? And, um, and just, you know, does drawing animate, animate objects or give a different kind of relationship with um, works that are in museum collections, you know, you know, is there is there sort of an animating relation that that's set up there? Um, you know, it, it was just interesting to think about sort of where the agency lies because in some ways it felt as though actually these objects had a life of their own and a, and a spiritual power of their own. But what happens in that moment of of um, connection through drawing? Um, so I wonder. I don't know if anyone listening has thoughts on that too, but. I, I think that's a brilliant point, there, Claudia. I, I think it, it occurred to me that, you know, the questions I had initially were slightly, you know, were things like, is it okay to, you know, are these just objects again that reinforce the female, you know, the male gaze or, but that just doesn't seem so relevant somehow. I mean, it is relevant, it's very important. Um, but I think the idea, I think there's a real, um, give and take in terms of looking and taking. And I think the objects I, I felt could well look after themselves is what I felt. <laughs> they have such a strong sense of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, 
I wondered if there was any infighting actually between them. The, the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they had, I, I mean, yeah, maybe at night, maybe at night. But I think drawing from them is a really wonderful experience as an artist. Mm. Thank you. Um, well, uh, and I, I, you know, really want to make sure there is a, a little bit of time for, for questions. And I know there's uh, one question that's that's come up um, uh, for you, Belinda. Um, uh, having enjoyed the exhibition, um, it's from Joe Mason, um, and um, they're writing that whilst there are probably many deities you had to edit out, and I know that was the case, wasn't it, that, you know, it couldn't be comprehensive. Um, I'd be interested to know if the Black Madonna was considered, I've come across the idea that she is related to Artemisia of Ephesus, amongst others, which is exciting. So, that's yeah. a good question. So, the Black Madonna is fascinating. Um, mm. She is not in the exhibition, but she is discussed um, a bit in the catalogue. So for the, the catalogue of the show, what, first of all, as I mentioned, the show will be going on tour after it, uh, after it closes at the end. And some of the venues that it's going to be shown in later are much bigger, so we've had the opportunity to put in more objects and explore more spiritual beings um, and also expand the narrative of some of these. And we've also done this in the catalogue um, as well, where we didn't quite have the right objects to talk about them in the exhibition, but we still felt they merited conversation uh, in the catalogue. So Black Madonna is um, mentioned in the catalogue in relation to the many different ways that Mary have, has um, been represented, not only in Abrahamic traditions, as I mentioned before, but her influence um, on spiritual traditions outside of that. And um, particularly in relation to uh, Haitian voodoo, where the image of the Black Madonna is used to represent um, Azimi Dan, so the, the um, spirit um, of uh, sort of, which is a very sort of martial, aggressive figure. And the imagery of the Black Madonna has been um, used to express this um, voodoo spirit. And also imagery of Mary um, in uh, another guise is used to represent um, Azimi Freya, who's a spirit of sort of beauty and sexuality as well. Both of these Haitian spirits are represented through the imagery of Mary. And this is something that we see in a lot of other faiths around the world, this imagery of Mary, mm. um, because of its sort of global recognition has been incorporated and aspects of Mary's character have been sort of um, melded with other spiritual beliefs about female beings and feminine authority and come to be expressed through really Mary. I mean, Mary, I think this was one of the most fascinating parts of the exhibition for me to work on was to learn about Mary and how multifaceted she is in different parts of the world. Um, so yeah, there's many there's many occasions like that where we haven't been able to talk in detail about some sort of either fascinating spiritual being or an aspect of the being that we are talking about because there are just so many and in a way I find that quite inspiring itself that there's just so much content that we couldn't possibly include it all and I very much hope that this exhibition uh, and indeed the capital will will just be seen as a sort of like a springboard to go and find out more and just inspire some, um, open that sort of window onto a really broad and fascinating subject. Thank you, Belinda, thank you. I've got a few more moments for questions if, if anyone wants to sort of last, uh, ask anything last minute. Um, but just uh, something I was thinking when Sarah was talking through the, the Biennale, the works on Biennale, and, and also through um, your presentation, Belinda, was about sort of questions of, of environment and, you know, the, 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 I suppose the figure of Mother Nature or Mother Earth, um, uh, the sort of deity of the Earth that, that um, in her different guises, um, looms really large um, in the exhibition, but also, you know, taps into so many of the, the urgent questions we're, we're, we're seeking, failing to answer today, I suppose, um, and that seem to sort of underlie some of the, the work in the, in the Biennale. Um, I just wondered, if yeah. was this something that was emerging as you were thinking, as you were curating the show, and, and, and Sarah, did that, was that sort of something that you, you felt um, was emerging in, in the Biennale too. 
Yeah, well, certainly the the section where we're looking at um, embodiments of the earth and creation mm. was, was quite tricky in some ways. Um, Sarah, I noticed that one of your images, I wonder if I could just go back. It's, and it's, I think was of Patrick go on, Martin, um, here, it's which is actually, sorry. No, 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 sorry, there's delay slightly. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, there, there are many uh, earth mothers or spiritual beings that come mm. to the earth um, that is it's sort of very difficult to talk about in an exhibition space because they are literally the earth and not generally or like um, in the past they haven't been shown in anthropomorphic form. So it's really through contemporary art that we can start telling those stories and um and i think this goes with the goes for Judy chicago's representation as well that there is more of a history of showing god in western art for figures like pachamama um this interest in the sort of revival of interest is really coming up through contemporary art and um i think leading to a sort of interrogation of how they're visualized um so for some of the figures in that section we just didn't have the objects to represent them because that's not they're sort of all around us in the landscape rather than being mm -hmm. sort of physical work that you can put in a show um one of the ways that we looked at this which i think um resonates quite nicely with some of the images that sarah was showing um of the the weaving um this one in particular, the weaving and the knotting. And um, this made me think of the Judy Chicago work, which was a print made to be a model for a huge tapestry. And she was very explicitly using embroidery um, as the medium for the birth project because it's um, an art form which is so readily associated with women's skill. And this is something else that we see in the exhibition as well, where next to Jude Chicago, we have um, a woven cloak from New Zealand, which was woven by Maori women. Um, and this is part of Maori women's connection with the earth goddess, Papatu Nuku, who um, is of the earth and provides the flax. And Maori cloaks are um, incredibly highly prized. Um, very complex to make and they're always made by women's expression not only of women's skill but of women's spiritual um, closeness to the earth um, and that's why I'm not sure if that's what we're looking at in this work as well but it seems to me that um, Mukherjee has also chosen a sort of fabric based medium for this work perhaps in uh, reference to women's weaving as well. Yeah definitely for sure. Mm. Um, just as a probably a final question, I mean, this is a huge question, and I think in a way Sarah's sort of meditated really thoughtfully on it anyway, but um, uh, a question um, from Sharon Holloway about why modern art or contemporary art is led more by the rational rather than the spiritual. Um, and she goes on to ask, uh, I wonder if taking on the male rational right brain thinking we have lost, in, in taking on the male rational right brain thinking we've lost the power of the feminine. Um, and the feminine being associated with the left brain and the spiritual journey. So that's a big question to end on, but um, maybe maybe you want to just touch on that. Well, I don't, yes, yeah, it's very difficult to take such big questions in such yeah. a short time. But I mean, the, the, these things occur to me on a daily basis in the studio, um, um, especially having dealt with um, Angelica Kaufman, who was such an artist of the Enlightenment and um, learning about the Enlightenment at the time and the necessity for that. And this, it's, it's quite interesting to me. I also wondered if the artists, if in a way the art world was becoming, in, becoming more inclusive and more diverse in its representation of artists, the type of artists that are allowed into the art world. Mm. Um, we are then now sort of experiencing a kind of wealth of diverse spiritual and religious experience from lots of different backgrounds. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we, we probably should draw to a close and we could probably carry on um, this discussion. <laughs> so many yeah. um, but, um, but thank you both so much for, for, for your, your conversation and your insights. Um, and it's been a real it's been a real pleasure talking to you both. Um, I think, you know, one, one of the most exciting things about the exhibition is that it it really invites us to reimagine and, and revisit the collection. And many of these works, I understand, were sort of in the basements or in parts hadn't, or neglected, let's say, or hadn't been on view um, so prominently before. So, so it's really, I, I really encourage everyone listening to, to go and see the exhibition if, if they can, um, or to, to, to engage with it through the catalogue or the conversations that, um, that Belinda's um, brought, brought out for us. So um, thank you both for joining us and thank you to everyone listening and for channeling feminine power this <laughs> evening. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, as well. Thank you, Belinda. Thank you, Claudia. Good night.